uh, we have a fabulous conversation uh, for you this morning. And I was joking with both uh, Frank and Des, I, it, it, nearly the feat of getting these two gentlemen in the same city, on the same day, in the same hour, was probably our most challenging aspect of organizing uh, this conversation. Um, this summer, at two separate events, I had an opportunity to spend some time with, with Des Brown at a dinner and with Frank at a separate dinner, and I realized we needed to bring them together for a conversation. We had hoped to do this, of course, before uh, September the 18th, before the Scottish referendum, but schedules didn't align, and we thought, well, one way or the other, we're going to have something to talk about regardless of the outcome. And today, we thought this would be a great opportunity a month after, a little bit more than a month after the Scottish referendum, to take a step back, look at uh, the results, how everyone is feeling, both in Scotland and in England, and where this process goes from here, how it impacts defense uh, issues, security, transatlantic issues, and then we'll widen the aperture out a bit and talk about uh, what comes next year, British general elections, the new strategic defense and security review, uh, the 2015 defense spending review. There's a lot going on in British defense policy that we'd love to tease out a bit. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about what is this transatlantic security relationship doing in the wider global context, whether that is vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, increased Russian aggression in Europe, whether that's ISIS in the Middle East or even challenges in the Asia Pacific region. So lots to talk about, fabulous colleagues uh, to, to help us tease out these important issues. And again, we welcome you into this conversation. So let me begin by introducing uh, Des Brown, who's the, uh, let me make sure I get this, I, I love wonderful rich titles, the Right Honorable Lord Brown of Ladyton, Des Brown. and. But uh, in America, the infor informality is always, hi, Des, welcome. Uh, Des Brown is the uh, vice chairman of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. We share something in common. The chairman of NTI is Sam Nunn, also the chairman of CSIS. So we hold uh, uh, a great uh, commonality there. Um, Des, uh, extraordinary uh, service to the United Kingdom, elected a member of parliament, in 1997 served to 2010, but has served in a variety of government positions, Parliament Under Secretary of State to Northern Ireland, uh, Minister of State for Work, the list goes on, but in 2006 he was appointed Secretary of State for Defense, and that's where I think we worked uh, most closely with you, and of course in 2007 and 2008 you combined that role with the role of Secretary of State for Scotland. So uh, well poised to help us uh, understand the complicated issues of uh, certainly British defense and Scotland's role in that. Welcome so much, Des. And then we're delighted to have Frank Miller with us, a principal of the Scowcroft Group. Um, Frank, also, these two have an extraordinary amount of distinguished public service. Uh, Frank had worked in the government for well over 30 years, 22 of those in the Defense Department, held incredible senior positions, also served as special assistant to President George W. Bush uh, in the National Security Council as senior director for defense policy and arms control, where I had the good fortune of working um, with Frank. Um, and speaking of titles, you have one yourself, my friend. Uh, in 2006, Frank was awarded an honorary knighthood, a knight commander of the order of the British Empire, so congratulations on that. And uh, Frank currently serves on the Defense Policy Board and is a, uh, uh, serves on the U.S. Strategic Command Advisory Group. So, as I said, incredibly knowledgeable. We're about to have a great conversation about, after the Scottish referendum, implications for Scotland, the United Kingdom, for the United States, for NATO and what comes next. So Des, let me turn to you for some opening comments, and we'll turn to Frank. We'll get into the issues and bring you in. Welcome again, Des. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed, Heather, for those uh, kind words. It should be easier for the foreseeable future to get me in the same room as other people I will be in, yes. working and living in Washington, D.C. for the next couple of years, working for NTI. Um, so for at least that period of time, I'd be happy to here. It's an honour and a privilege to be invited to uh, contribute to a discussion in this great institution, um, and it's a real pleasure to be uh, on, a, on, a, on a platform with both uh, you and Frank. Our paths have crossed lots in the past, and we 
I think we can say we know and respect each other. We don't always agree, but that's a good thing. So, um, okay, like just a few words to start with. They will not be comprehensive because the implications of what happened on the 18th of September and before in Scotland are quite significant and far-reaching, and they are continuing. You know, and Scots are still trying to work out what that uh, result meant and will mean for them in the future, and there are processes ongoing. Um, and those of you who follow UK politics will know that this has implications for the Constitution at large in the United Kingdom, um, and the English in particular, or at least some of them, although the English are utterly tolerant of uh, the Scots' constant complaints about having to be part of the same island group as England, and I find them their uh, patience in relation to the people of Scotland is uh, manifest and admirable. But um, I, don't, I don't think the majority of them obsess about this, but there is a discussion going on about what is called English Votes for English Jobs. I'm happy to discuss that if people want to, but it kind of muddies the water about Scotland. So I, you know, rather, other than just making reference to it, I'll, I'll go into that only if people are interested in the conversation or if the conversation takes us there. Okay, so let's start with what we know. I mean, there are some certainties about this. So on the 18th of September, the people of Scotland voted by a majority of about 10% to stay in the United Kingdom. So this is still a British accent. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Which I'm delighted about. I mean, let me make that clear. I am very much in favour of the United Kingdom and keeping it together. You know, I, I argued in Scotland with my fellow countrymen and women and those who live with us who had the vote that, you know, we had in the cooperation among distinctive nations and uh, in, in the islands of the United, a level of cooperation and sharing that many parts of the world are looking for, and it seemed absolutely mad to break that up when other people were aspiring to it. Um, and we should be we should we should be celebrating that, and maybe, you know, when we get our feet out of the clay of the aftermath of this, then we will find a way of doing that. But it is quite a difficult thing to do. So, 45 percent, 55 percent. I mean. I'm sorry, Heather, but the, the, the first three or four questions on your flyer for this are relatively easy to answer. You know, there is a process going on in terms of constitutional reform for Scotland because the unionist parties, the parties that, are, that form or are likely to form the government of the United Kingdom promised collectively, individually and collectively latterly, that the people of Scotland would get more devolution. Should they stay, they would get more devolution. There are a number of different phrases for that. Home rule, devo max, which is obviously pretty obvious what that is. It's kind of drawn from Coca-Cola's great marketing. But um, so uh, d d d devo max, uh, one or two other phrases. But it essentially means increased powers for uh, the Scottish Parliament. The parts of the powers that those who favour independence or more home rule are interested in is getting their hands on fiscal powers. They want their hands on the ability to be able to set tax rates. Um, whether that's a sensible thing in the long term or not to do, time will tell. But we have in Europe examples of the separation of fiscal and monetary policy that were not greatly successful. Um, you know, and we have to reflect on that. But, but Scots are not stupid and they will reflect on that. And, and in passing, I say to you that because we've been in this debate for a long period of time, the Scottish people are very, very, very knowledgeable about these issues. I mean, this is a very well-informed electorate, 86% of whom voted in the uh, independence campaign. And in the area of Scotland that I live in, 92% of the people voted. I mean, these are extraordinary turnouts for developed, uh, sophisticated societies and their engagement in politics. But it was a relatively simple question in, in the sense of yes, no, there was no complication about it. Um, so, uh, uh, l l I mean, I think we can put to rest the question as to whether or not that process, which is in the hands of a man called Lord Smith of Kelvin and is therefore known as the Smith Commission, we can put at rest as to whether or not that will devolve further powers to Scotland in the area of defence or intelligence or foreign affairs. It won't. Um, I mean, I have here for those of you who doubt, a printed copy of the Scottish Government and the SNP's submission to um, the Smith Commission, and in page 13 of it, uh, they specifically say that defence, intelligence and foreign affairs, among others, 
um, among other areas of policy, be, should be left under the control of the UK Parliament. So there is no possibility of us having a split responsibility for defence. They're not arguing for it, and the Smith Commission is un unlikely to. In fact, it will not recommend that, that be devolved. So, so we're back, you know, with the UK Parliament and UK government making decisions in relation to uh, defence and intelligence. Let me just share with you a couple of other observations, and you make of them what you will. The common view is that the vast majority, that's the phrase that all politicians love, the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people in Scotland want to see the Trident nuclear defence system out of Scottish waters. It's not true. I mean, there, is a, there are a majority of people who would favour its removal from Scotland. Um, it's not a vast majority. In February of 2013, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament commissioned polling, and that polling showed that 60% 60, 60 of people did not want, 60% of people in Scotland did not want Scotland to invest in the future of its strategic defence with large nuclear weapon systems, namely the Trident missile base system. Um, but subsequent polling, which was carried out to challenge that in a more independent and less leading fashion, suggested that perhaps that figure was more like 50%, 49% or thereabouts. More independent polling revealed that 51% of people in Scotland were happy to see a renewed nuclear nuclear uh, system be retained in Scotland and invested in, but 39 of that 51% argued for a much smaller, much less expensive uh, system. The arguments for that, I think, were probably disposed of in any event by another independent review that was carried out, and I'm, you know, although fundamentally a disarmer, I'm not in favour of that in any event. I don't think it's a wise thing for those of us who would like to see fewer nuclear weapons in the world to show the world that a pocket nuclear weapon system, which is less expensive, is a thing that you can achieve. <laughs> and I think it's good, a, a good argument. Many more people will want them, in my view, and it will be a, an injection to proliferation. And I'm not in favour of bolting nuclear warheads onto all sorts of missiles. We've done that in the past. You know, we know the downsides of it. So. Um, the, 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 the final point I wanted to make just about the motivation of the Scottish people is that post the referendum poll, polling revealed that when people were asked what motivated them to vote the way in which they did, only 29% of the people in Scotland suggested that defence or related issues were of any relevance to their decisions when they were offered from a menu to pick three. So I'm not... It was only 29% of people motivated at all to put it in a basket of three. So these issues, you know, were important rhetorically to the debate, but they were not significantly important or decisive in relation to people's votes. Having said that, in my view, attempts on the part of the unionist, the no vote side, to make this a big issue in their favour backfired on them. I think we could actually empty rooms in Scotland when people try to argue that the 7,500 jobs at Faz Lane, you know, should be kept there, um, and that b being the home for the strategic defence of the country was it was a good thing for Scotland. Nobody was really interested in discussing that, and even those people who make the argument best, um, you know, would get groans from the audience when they raise these issues. Um, so this is a complicated. Um, psychology as far as the Scottish people are concerned, you know, and traditionally, and we were talking about this, um, you know, privately before we opened this discussion up, you know, Scots are mercenaries. <laughs> you know, I mean, Scots go across, have gone across the world traditionally for years. They, disprop they are disproportionately represented, particularly in the army, although that's changing presently because of the, the separation between units of the army and lo locations. Um, in Scotland with modernisation of armed forces, but Scots make a disproportionate contribution to defence um, and, uh, and to government, indeed, in, in, in the United Kingdom, but they have made a disproportionate contribution to defence all across the world and, you know, moved as mercenaries in previous uh, centuries. Um, so despite all of that, these issues were not that important. Um, just maybe... A couple of words, they will be very generalised, Heather. I don't want to take up all the time here, but I think it's important. We will 
next year have a strategic defence review, combined probably or following on from yet another uh, financial review. Um, my friend and so, erstwhile colleague Malcolm Chalmers has recently written at Rusi on this. I recommend his paper to you. Um, the probability is that we may find ourselves as a result of the combination of these two processes for the first time spending less than 2% of our GDP uh, on defence. And actually, you know, if all the dire predictions of further cuts in public spending and their implications work their way through, you know, and if you take from our spending on defence, which we currently credit to it, um, the, spending, the current spending in Afghanistan, the historical spending in Afghanistan, because we will be out of Afghanistan, by 2020-21, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility and probable that we will be spending about 1.5% of our GDP um, on defence. There are two dynamics that cause this. One will be continued austerity, which is the flavour of the month with all governments across the world in the face of the continuing eco economic challenges, you know, and a desire to reduce the percentage of, of uh, to reduce the percentage of GDP that is spent by the, the central government to uh, the, 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 the 30 percent as opposed to the 40 percent which it's presently in. But also there will be a revision of the way in which we calculate GDP to reflect changing international accounting standards. That will cause an increase in uh, the GDP in, in financial terms of the United Kingdom because of the effect it will have on our public accounting. So therefore, the percentage will go down disproportionately because of the, 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 the effect of these two uh, processes. Um, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of other things that you, you want to talk about, and you have been given tasters of the possibility that we may even get into more global issues and the effect of the Scottish referendum on them. I'm not sure that I can live up to that, but, um, but I'll leave it there. These are just some facts I share with you in order to inform and hopefully help the discussion. Thanks, Sarah. Des, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And it gives Frank a great entrance into it talking does. about, from the view from the United States, how do we look at these issues? Well. It's a pleasure to be here, Heather. Thanks, thanks for, for having me, and it's a pleasure to, to be um, on a podium with, with, with my friend Des. I, when, when our mutual friend, um, George Robertson, Lord Robertson, was in the United States in April at Brookings, um, he said that uh, a decision um, for Scotland, by Scotland, to go independent would have been cataclysmic, would be cataclysmic for which he got a lot of stick um, uh, north of the border, so to speak. Um, but I think he was right. I think a cataclysm was averted. Um, if, we, if we think about it realistically, it would have meant first and foremost a diminution uh, of the UK's role in the world. And I think at this point in our history, um, we can ill afford to, to have the UK play a smaller role in the world. Um, for the remaining United Kingdom, as that phrase emerged, it would have been the loss of, of vital geography. Uh, it would have been a loss of talent. Uh, it would have been a blow to the economy. And it would have been the loss of some military assets which will be needed by a robust UK in the world. And at the end of the day, it would have left Scotland alone and undefended um, because an independent Scotland could not muster a defense capability uh, which would have been worth very much. Uh, it would not have gotten into NATO. Indeed, it would not have gotten into the EU. And um, one of the lines that I wish Alastair Darling had deployed in his debates was that the SNP's version of an independent Scotland was one which outsourced its national security to the United States and, and its financial resources to the Bank of England, but he didn't. Um, and then there's the question of Trident. Um, I think, I have, I have believed for decades um, that, that the United Kingdom's uh, independent nuclear deterrent plays a critical role in global affairs. And I think that that 
continues to be true now, particularly now, even more so now, with the deterioration in relations with Russia and with Putin's um, heavy-handed nuclear blackmail diplomacy and his over-reliance on nuclear weapons. So I think that a UK nuclear deterrent is vital to the United Kingdom, it's vital to the United States, in fact, and it's vital to NATO. As part of that, I, I believe that the UK deterrent must always have a, a, an SSBN at sea on constant patrol. If Scotland had voted for independence, and if the Trident fleet had been expelled from Faslane, it might or might not have been the end of the UK deterrent. Um, uh, reverting to, to phrases that, that Des and I both well know. With sufficient will and sufficient money and sufficient time, London could have found a new home for not only the SSBNs, which was the easy part, but for the warhead storage. But whether that time, will, and money existed would have been a very difficult question. So, so it certainly is, is something from a deterrent standpoint uh, to, to celebrate. I absolutely agree with Des and everything he said. There will be no devolution of defense, foreign intelligence, or, or uh, uh, nuclear policy to Holyrood. Um, I think the near-term impact of the strategic defense review for Scotland, which remains in the United Kingdom, is that there will be continued business in the shipyards along the Clyde as the new Type 26 destroyer is built. And that's good for Scotland and it's good for the UK. The question facing the British defense budget, indeed the British defense role in the world, foreign policy role in the world, Britain's role in the world, is not dissimilar to the questions which will face a new American administration in, in uh, 2016. We are all under budgetary pressure. Um, we are all weary of having been involved in the wars in the Middle East uh, since 2001. And yet, and yet, there are no replacements for American and British leadership in the world. There are, no, there are no replacements for American and British leadership in the world. If we do not do it, whether it is in Europe or in Asia or in the Middle East, vacuums will exist or existing vacuums will become larger. And at the end of the day, we'll get sucked in anyway. I'd make one quick point on, on the 2%. I myself, heretically, am not a believer in 2%. I believe 2% is an input figure, not an output figure. And I'm more interested in output than input. And indeed, one way, one way you, can, you can increase uh, your defense budget's percentage of GDP is to drop your GDP. Greece has recently gone over 2% for its defense budget because its GDP has dropped. <coughs> this is not a course that I would recommend for anybody. Um, but I think more importantly, and, and Heather's heard me say this too many times, I think, okay. from your perspective, mm -hmm. the critical thing that we Americans don't recognize is that the British military is not only our most capable ally technologically, but in terms of forces which are available to be deployed around the world at any time, and which are on a par with our own, there is no other equal. If you look at a, at a, at a well-trained, uh, relatively well-resourced British Army uh, in the 80 to 100,000 person band, if you look at an Air Force of Tornadoes and Eurofighters and soon F-35s, uh, a Navy which deploys nuclear-powered attack submarines and four SSBNs and soon aircraft carriers, 
um, as well as modern surface ships, uh, three commando ships, and a Royal Marine uh, Commando Brigade. This is an incredible fighting force, which is of great value to global stability. So I would urge people to focus on that. I have no, no prediction on where the SDSR goes, and it will be the classic situation as the new British government of whatever stripe it happens to be struggles with austerity, struggles with the National Health Service funds, and struggles with the world, which is unfortunately becoming even more messy. But um, why don't I stop there? Thanks, Frank. Both of you, great, great food for thought. Let me, uh, we'll start getting the questions going here, giving colleagues a, a chance to, to formulate their own questions. Des, I want to pull you back a little bit on the politics post-referendum, and then let's get into the meat on, on the defense side. I'm going to challenge you to say, is this really over? Yeah. Because um, some have argued that by reaching 45 percent voting for independence, in some way this has been a trajectory that has been growing and building momentum since 1997 when this first became a possibility. That should, and there's some questions about should the Smith Commission not able to deliver and the, the challenges that now Westminster is facing with the West Lothian question and, and trying to figure out the political formulation here. Will this be revisited? And I'm also thinking, should Prime Minister Cameron be reelected uh, next May, which then brings us to uh, the EU referendum by 2017? That will also spark a reaction by Scotland to say, that's not the direction I want to go. I want to go in a different direction. Again, depending on the May 2015, uh, we could feel some electoral reverberation. That's the next time the Scots go to the polls. And you know, perhaps S&P will do even better. Labor may do, may suffer from that. Help us understand, again, the aftershocks may continue to be felt. And maybe this question hasn't been settled for a generation. And so I'd, I'd welcome your your um, thoughts on that. And, and I will say just from watching and analyzing this from, from Washington, I felt in some ways Washington and London had the same problem. We didn't believe any of this could happen. No one was looking at this very seriously until those polls started to tighten. And we all went, oh, oh is there something to look at here? Uh-oh, oh, oh. And we all felt, I think we got a little flat-footed about the implications of all of this, we weren't paying attention because we didn't think a 20% gap in public opinion, we didn't think this was a problem. Did we miscalculate here in Washington and certainly in, in London that this could have been a possibility? It's a pretty straightforward question. Uh, <laughs> um, no, that's, that's all right. Let me, uh, let me try and unpick it a bit without uh, trying to answer all of it because it kind of, I think, uh, well, I mean, other people will want to make contributions. So, um, l l l let me, before I do that, just, just, <laughs> you know, Frank and I agree about lots of things, but, um, you know, Scotland would not have been alone and undefended, and it would have got into NATO, and it would have got into the EU. And we, you know, I mean, the, p p part of the problem, I think, with the Scottish people is, you know, I mean, the Scottish people are not stupid. And saying things to them, like some of the things that we were urged to say to them in terms of trying to keep the... Um, uh, the United Kingdom together w w was not wise. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they would have got in immediately. I mean, they wouldn't become independent and, and become members of it immediately. And of course, there would have been a significant challenge with the European Union because, you know, what was happening in Scotland was energising nationalism and independence minded people across Europe, and in particular Spain, you know, has a very heightened antenna to these issues, you know, and, and flitted with telling the Scottish people you know, you'll not get in or we'll make it difficult. Oh, no, we don't really mean that, you know. Um, I, mean, I mean, there are just some, some things that are improbable in modern democratic societies, you know, and it is improbable that five million people who are members and citizens of the EU will be denied that status because they vote for self-determination. Now, on what conditions they would have been allowed to join as an independent country is an interesting discussion, but they would have got in. And I think we, you know, you know we, can, we, we should put that kind of can up to bed. The Scottish National Party realised that an independent Scotland in its size could not defend its assets 
unless it was part of an alliance. Their actual preference as a political movement was to find some synergy with northern European Scandinavian countries whom they think think the same as they do about these issues, but they discovered that the majority of them and those that had the capabilities were all in NATO. So, so they rethought their policy in relation to NATO. Now, they dressed it up in all sorts of other different ways, but that was what happened. They then fought with their party, which is still in a significant uh, minority opposed to membership of NATO to change the policy, change the policy, and would have sought membership of NATO. Now, it would have been an interesting discussion that a party which set its face against nuclear weapons, it would have been an interesting discussion between NATO and them as to in what terms they could join and how they could, you know, as a non-nuclear country, become part of a nuclear armed alliance. Now, these were in the too difficult basket for them to answer in the course of the debate, so they were just part for another day. But we would have sorted them out. And we would have sorted them out, I think, in some fashion. It might not have been entirely the way in which they wanted it sorted out, and they would have had to make the compromise, because there is no way that the NATO alliance would have left that big chunk of sea and land, you know, undefended and not part of its jurisdiction. So, you know, I mean, with respect, Frank, you know, we need to stop saying this, and that's the sort of stuff that was emptying rooms across the country when people were saying these sorts of things. Uh, okay. Right. Say that an independence would eventually yeah. Okay. Well, the NATO and the EU. If that's the best I get out of you, then I chalk it up as a success, and I'm happy <laughs> with that. Okay. Right. So. It so, ends. <laughs> so. Um, so it is not over. Of course it's not over. And, 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 and the probability is that it will never be over. You know, um, because it's been going on all of my lifetime in politics, I mean, before 1987, and it will continue because there are, you know, at least a third of the people of Scotland who emotionally want independence. And they're not going to go away. You know, we live with them and they're not going to change their minds. So they will continue. And that will have implications and abreactions from other parts of the United Kingdom and elsewhere, and people will make arguments. You know, if we had some English members of parliament or commentators here, then they would make very strongly the point that you cannot have a UK parliament in which, you know, former members or members like I was uh, of the House of Commons vote for laws in relation to health that affect the English when I don't have the power to vote for laws that affect health in relation to Scotland. Now, I mean, that's a respectable position, and we have to engage with it. But we have had an asymmetric country almost all of its existence. When, you know, post-1707, when Scotland and England negotiated and, and merged their parliaments, not their kingdoms, but their parliaments, we retained a separate uh, justice system, a separate law, a separate legal system, sorry. We retained a separate health system when, when we developed one. We retained a separate education system, markedly different than the English. Of course, with a shared parliament, these things have converged over time because the same parliament has been passing legislation, they've converged, but we, we, we have reinstated that difference. But you know, and, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, Northern Ireland, it was part of the United Kingdom, had not only uh, its own parliament, it had its own prime minister, you know, because, because Ruling Northern Ireland in that fashion suited the policy intentions of the UK government. Um, you know, and, and, and presently, you know, we have significant devolved powers to London. We have police commissioners in some parts of the United Kingdom and not in others. We have elected mayors in some places and not in others. You know, and these people all enjoy different forms of uh, power. Now, all of this is constantly in a state of flux and has to be worked through. Um, personally, I think trying to trying to resolve the conundrum of the West Lothian question, the English votes for English laws, you know, will cause you to have a breakdown. You know, I mean, when, when almost 90% of the country is represented or, you know, by England, what decision is made that relates to England that doesn't affect anyone else? I mean, I give you just a, a simple example. An issue of great contention in the United Kingdom is whether or not there should be a third runway at Heathrow Airport. If a third runway is built at Heathrow Airport, which is an enormous hub airport, dominates part of the world, never mind part of the United Kingdom, is that an English decision? Or does that have implications for Scotland? Well, you know what the answer is. Of course it does. You know? And we have a method of 
of calculating additional expenditure for Scotland called the Barnett formula that uh, I won't try to explain it to you, but it operates on the basis of a percentage of what is allocated to England is allocated to, uh, you know, to, 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 to Scotland. So almost every financial decision that is made for approximately 90% of the country has an effect on the other 10%. You know, so it's quite difficult to do this. You know, and if the Prime Minister wants to do it in lockstep with the Smith Commission, whom he's charged to, do, to, to decide, on additional uh, powers for the Scottish Parliament by November, well, good luck to him, you know. But I think we will get pie the end of November and it will not be resolved. Um, I, and, you know, I, of course there are other dynamics. There is UKIP. <laughs> you know, we have this developing political agenda, which is a manifestation of something that we all observe, which is a kind of anti-politics vote that is growing in different places and indeed has created the government of Hungary, God help them. Um, you know, I mean, there is an anti-politics vote out there that is looking for receptacles, you know, and UKIP, which is well led, has been very successful in getting that vote and now, you know, sits in the mid to late teens of votes and all polling and will be, have a significant effect you know, on, 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 on the next election. I'm not going to predict what will happen in 2015, but there are lots of very difficult decisions to be made, particularly in the area of public spending. Um, and all of the parties aspire to and are likely to be in government have set themselves on almost the same course about reduced public spending. It seems to me, and this will open up an interesting discussion, it seems to me improbable that an inconclusive result, and that's a possibility of the next election, will allow a Prime Minister to say in series the following things. I am committed to further austerity and therefore cutting between 20 and 40 billion pounds out of public spending with the effect that that will have on education, health, transport, all the other public services that people depend on. This situation will perhaps persist throughout the whole course of this Parliament which is five years. Oh, and by the way, I'm just about to spend, however you cut it, 30 billion or 65 billion on nuclear weapons. Is that okay? Now, that seems to me improbable. Now, I know that, that there are many people who argue that that is now settled, but it seems to be improbable. And if it is not a majority conservative government, I say freely to people that my prediction, I'm not a betting man, I won't bet on it, but if I was, I probably would. My prediction is that any other outcome will cause the Prime Minister to reach for the tool that all politicians do in those circumstances and have another review. <laughs> so, in order to buy some time is to resolve this conundrum. Um, but it is, th these are difficult issues. Um, and, you know, I, I just, my final point is, the outcome of the NATO summit and the ambition whether two, I agree with Frank about 2%, uh, the, the, uh, because it's about, it's about what you do with the money that you spend. And actually, the United Kingdom gets better bang for its buck than anybody else. Arguably, France does as well, um, the way in which it spends its percentage of GDP on, uh, on than, and in any other European country. But, but the ambition was to get, a, to get a commitment from NATO countries to some expression of investment in defence. What they got was an aspiration <laughs> at the end of it, which is hardly worth the paper it's written on, but they got an aspiration. Those who understand Europe understand why, because almost every European country is facing a challenging economic environment, and in those circumstances, it is improbable that they will be able to go back to their parliaments and their people and expect to get re-elected if they significantly invest in defence, because most of them are much more interested in issues of national identity than they are in issues of physical security. By that, I mean most of the people who vote in Europe are interested in that, and that's where the, the, the dynamic in discussion is going on. If you look at the British, uh, the European papers, you will see that they are dominated by illegal migration, Islamicisation, you know, um, crimes by foreigners, domestic culture under threat, taxpayer money wasted in aid. You know, this is all about our national identities, our respective national identities. That's the debate in Europe at the moment, not our physical security. We don't think we're under any significant threat. Whether we are or not, 
I'll be happy to hear what people say, but that's, that's the position. Thank you, Des. I'm going to let all of you, and I want to ask Frank one more question. I'm so glad we have a lot of hands. Guys, are you ready? These uh, CSIS audience is asking <coughs> really tough questions, so I hope you're ready. <coughs> Frank, my question to you, Paul, if you were sitting at the National Security Council today, and you were charged with uh, having a very detailed conversation with your British counterparts on the next year's SDSR. And you saw that the, the, the costs for the two aircraft carriers, the Trident replacement, and looking at what's left and keeping the British military our most capable and able partner. What advice would you tell them? I, I remember I was in London when the 2010 review came out, and I think there was shock in Washington about the 8% cut <coughs> now, in, 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 uh, in the defense of the British MOD. They had to right themselves. There was a lot of debt. They had to they balance themselves. But what would your talking points be to them as we look towards 2015 with all the pressures that Des just said? general election in May, a lot of promises, unclear how a new government can deliver all of them. What would your advice be to, to your counterparts? I think, I think I would start by looking at the world situation. And I think I would, I would focus on the fact that we are facing a level of concern with respect to Russian military developments, unprecedented in the period of time since the wall has come down, um, and that the United States and the United Kingdom as NATO's principal military powers have to bear that burden. Um, I'm not that worried about the cost of the nuclear deterrent because that will be spaced out over a 15-year period as the new boats are built. And of course, the United Kingdom derives enormous um, uh, financial and, and, and economic benefit from, from being part of the Triton II system. So that, that is rather a stretch cost. Um, and the cost of buying new kit is, is obviously a concern. Um, and yet the aircraft carriers give Britain a power projection capability, which as Americans, we certainly resonate with and welcome. Um, so I guess, Heather, I, I would say that, that if I were providing advice, not knowing where our own defense budget's going, you know, that one has to be careful as, as to where one cuts further. I mean, the baseline today <laughs> is a very different baseline than it was 15 years ago or so. It was a very different baseline than the one that Des was dealing with when he was Secretary of State for Defense. So, um, you know, this is one where we just have to be very cautious as we proceed, uh, notwithstanding that some of our NATO allies are not prepared to invest in defense. That doesn't mean that, that we can shirk this burden, which is unique to the two capitals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, great. And then I think I'm just going to go around the table, so please. So please identify yourself. Thank you. Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. Frank, I think you accurately described the very high caliber forces that the UK has, land, sea, and air. Uh, I think it's also a, at least an arguable proposition that in the year 2025, if Britain modernizes its uh, nuclear forces uh, to maintain the same permanent uh, presence, that there will be a deep cut in those forces that you described. And so my question really is, from the U.S. perspective, are we better or worse off uh, with the U.K. conventional forces deeply cut, maintaining the current U.K. deterrent, or maintaining the, the current level of forces? And I guess my question for Des Brown is, how does that look from a U.K. perspective? Well, I think. Greg, you know, you won't be surprised that, that I would say that's a specious argument. Um, the cost of four new submarines over, the, over time um, is not that significant. The cost of the UK deterrent, as I recall, over the next 30 years is 6% of the British defense budget. 
um, the same argument is made by you and others with respect to U.S. nuclear modernization. You know, let's cut one of the legs of the triad. Again, the cost of the U.S. nuclear deterrent as a part of the overall defense budget um, is, is, is in the low single digits. Um, so at the end of the day, and you and I are not going to resolve this, uh, it's a question of whether or not you believe nuclear deterrence is important, whether or not you believe nuclear deterrence plays a role in preventing great power war. If you don't believe that, then you're not going to support the deterrent. If you believe that, particularly in a period of time when Putin is, is, is rattling the nuclear saber, if you believe that another brigade in the U.S. or British Army is a better deterrent than a trident at sea, you'll come to an obvious conclusion. I come to a different conclusion. Sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think like, this is a, spe a specious argument. I, mean, I think it's a very relevant question. Um, N not because I dispute Frank's vault. Uh, I mean, we've been, we've been in the nuclear deterrent business for a long time in the United Kingdom, but, you know, this is the second time that we are into heavy renewal. The, um, so it, it, I'm not saying there's an established pattern of doing this, but, but there was a belief particularly in the military family, that the capital costs of this system belong to the nation and were not part of the, the defense budget. You know, and, and, and we had, you know, we had a, an accounting system that had a kind of contingency, substantial contingency element to it. And we paid for renewal before or any significant capital expenditure out of that pot. So the defence budget was separate. Now, at the 2010 SDSR, and this passed in a kind of annex to it because the nuclear deterrent was not part of the review, but it passed in an annex to it. The Treasury won a battle it's been fighting for decades to get the people that wanted these things to pay for them in terms of their budget. So the comparatively small amount of money that's been spent on lead items for building SSBNs in anticipation of a positive decision in 2015 was paid for out of the defence budget since 2010. Having established that, the Treasury will not give that up. So this 6%, you know, will be effectively a 6% part of a reduced defence budget um, you know, and, and will deny investment in deployable capability. So it will be, it will have a very, very significant effect, given that the nature of procurement in defence is such that it is planned for decades in advance, and quite a lot of the money that they will be allocated, whatever it is in the budget, post the SDSR, will already be spent in any event for them. You know, and then, you know, you take into account the fact that you have significant numbers of personnel. There's very, very little of the defence budget or indeed of any government's budget that allows any decision making. A lot of it's committed for decades. So, you know, I think the point you make, you know, is, is a good point. And it will be, it is a point that I know is exercising, you know, the command of all of our services, including the Navy you know, who argue most vociferously for this investment because it puts them at the pinnacle of, you know, it is their justification for saying they are the senior servants, um, is that they have responsibility for strategic defence. Um, so, I, I, you know, I mean, th this, is, this is unknown territory for us in terms of debate, you know, and, and like here, you know, senior military officers are not shy at having a public discussion about these issues. <laughs> And there will be a significant public discussion about it. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, Frank won't say this, but, but I suspect that if you made our greatest ally and our cousins here in the United States tell us what it was they really wanted, they really want us to be there with them in deployable circumstances. They want to be able to reach to us, 
you know, because despite the fact that both of us have difficulty sometimes in the world now because of the last 15 years or so in persuading people that we're doing the right thing, we have a better chance of doing this if we are together, uh, both of us. So, you know, I think that's, uh, and, 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 you know, NATO tried to find another way to get uh, its European partners to invest in capabilities through pooling and sharing, which was the obvious answer to reduce budgets, efficiencies. It was dead, you know, at birth. It never, it never took off. Interoperability, pooling and sharing is the obvious answer to uh, deployable capabilities. But, you know, if you, if you live in an environment in which individual national caveats are controlled by parliaments and decisions are made about what troops can do in the ground and debates and discussions well into the night in national parliaments that cover you know very specific things then interoperability and pulling and sharing is very difficult to imagine so i think this is you know a discussion that we are bound to have um, and it will be a significant part of the international discussion in our relationship with the United States. And you know, from a European perspective, you know, I encourage, and I did when I was in an executive office, I encouraged people in the United States to the highest level uh, to establish more of an engagement of leadership in this area. You know, I mean, Europeans often wait to see in this area of policy, what does the United States want to do and try to get slightly, maybe a centimetre ahead of them so as it meets them there. You just need to be much more specific, I think, to your European allies what it is you want them to do, rather than standing back and you know, expecting them to work it out because on a number of occasions, not least about tactical nuclear weapons, we made the, we made, we made the wrong decision. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I, 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 would, I would quite like to have this discussion more openly across Europe and with the United States, you know, and leadership of the United States is extremely important. And that's really important also to the European Union in terms of its foreign policy as well, as well as NATO. And, that, you know, you have to remember the European Union is a set of different institutions with different membership but they still look to the United States for leadership. And if you, you know, if you look behind the one area where we have worked cl most closely together, apparently successfully, and that was in Iranian sanctions, you know, it was the threat of American rules implementing <laughs> or engaging with European institutions and businesses that made the European see sense rather than a willingness to buy into these sanctions of their own volition. Yes, sir. I'm James McGann. I'm with the Stimson Center. I'm also a former staff member of the Scottish National Party at the UK Parliament, uh, Ward Brown. Question about kind of the 2015 general election. So I was on the phone with uh, a UK member of Parliament who will remain anonymous about that election. <laughs> and I mean, they're being very optimistic, as they always are, about the elections. Uh, this MP was talking about potentially looking at current polling number, the SNP polling half of Scot Scotland's 59 seats in Scotland. Let's say they're right, which is definitely optimistic no matter how much their membership has increased since the referendum. Uh, he also made the argument that if they get that representation in London, they could potentially do some form of roadblock. They would have more political will to be able to stop Trident renewal uh, in 2016. So I, I'd kind of like your opinion on that, whether you think that's realistic or not. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the post-referendum surge that this whole part of politics got is quite significant. There is no question about that. You know, the SNP have enjoyed a, an enormous surge in their membership. You know, they're in the process at the moment of uh, declaring the deputy leader, the new leader, you know, and she sold out a, an amazing kind of entertainment venue with 20,000 seats in it quicker than you two did or something. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, all of this is true. I mean, it, this is, and you know, the Green Party, although we have the oddest Green Party in the world, I mean, we have a Green Party that argues for an independent country based on oil sales. I mean, I kind of don't, I don't get this. Well, I don't get this. I think they should be thrown out of the Green Party Federation, in my view. You know, I mean, it's kind of, we're supposed to leave this stuff in the ground. I thought the Green Party's, but anyway. Um, 
But the Green Party has also enjoyed a significant increase in membership. So there is a, and there's a, and there's a continuing dynamic, you know, which is, which is going on. Our, you know, if you go to the BBC Scotland website, the f significant number of the stories are about the aftermath and continuing debates about these issues, um, and, uh, and 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 that dominates the news. Although the actual poll for the referendum showed that the people who preferred the status quo are definitely a silent majority. <laughs> I mean, they sit, sat quietly most through most of the. Um, the campaign and then went and voted in significant numbers for the status quo to the surprise, I think, of these very people who are now predicting that they're about to get half of the, you know, they had private polling that I think they got Canadians to do, which was unwise, um, because they didn't understand that Scots can tell lies. I just, I just tell you a quick uh, anecdote. The, the, bookmaker, the bookmakers paid out the week before the poll on a no vote, right? And, and I, I went and spoke to some pals, I have pals who are bookmakers, and I went and spoke to the pals and they said, well, what you have to understand, Des, is that people tell pollsters lies, but people who bet on no, vote no. <laughs> so he said, they said, you know, we, we knew this was going to be a no, and we have known all throughout the whole, from, from, from the betting, and we paid out and closed the book because we didn't want to take any more bets on no. Um, so, um, so I, you know, I'm not going to get into the basis of prediction, and I don't know if they're still with the same polling company, the people you're talking to, but, um, but, you're, you're right, they're right to suggest that a, an increase in, in um, members of parliament from a number of possible sources, not just the SNP, could have a significant effect on this vote. You know, in 2006, when I had responsibility for what was then a decision that had to be made about the renewal of these boats, if I had depended on those people who were standing behind me on the Labour benches voting for it, we would not have won the vote. So, you know, dis despite where our party sits and has done since the 1980s on this issue, fundamentally we are an abolitionist party in terms of its representation in the majority. You know, so, and even um, members of parliament, you know, when they were on the government side of this decision, voted in the majority on, from the back benches against the renewal of Trident. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not predicting what will happen, but I'm just telling you this will be a very complicated vote, and it's by no means certain, you know, that a, that a, a right wing that is made up of elements other than traditional kind of conservatives could carry the day. It's by no means certain. But we'll need to wait and see what happens in 2015. I was going to say, Frank, do, do we, does Washington think it's set? I don't think it's set. Um, I don't think the SNP would enter would be entered into government. I think if the SNP took that many seats in Scotland, it would create some interesting, some interesting questions as to how a coalition were formed and on what basis. Um, noting that what happened last year what happened last year and is not necessarily predictive of 2015, it's at least useful to note that the. Um, parliamentary debate following the, uh, the government's completion of a study on renewing the nuclear deterrent um, showed both, uh, both major parties, Tories and Labour, to be supportive of renewing, replacing Trident submarines. Um, and, and make no mistake, and I'm, I'm not going to get into a debate that I know that Des and I could have offline as to what the Navy said and didn't say some time ago. When the Vanguard boats reach a certain age, they're going to have to be retired. Full stop. So if you don't replace the Vanguard boats, the UK gets out of the deterrent business. And, and if the United States were asked by British government, do you want us to get out of the deterrent business? Or do you want another brigade? I think the answer is the United States does not want to be the sole nuclear guarantor of the NATO alliance. And so, so having the UK there with us providing a nuclear deterrent would, would, would be very important. And finally, you know, if you look at the manifesto of the Labour Party concluded, what, a month ago? Six weeks ago? Something like that, right? No, well, it's not a month, sorry. Well, all right, sorry. What came out of the Labour Party conference? What's the correct word, Des? It's just a, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a policy brief. All right, all right. The policy brief coming out of the, out of the, out of the conference 
supports Trident renewal. Silent on the number of votes, that's fine, as was the, the Labour Party spokesman, spokes, spokes people during the debate in the Commons, saying that they would, they would support whatever technology would provide in order to keep a boat continuously at sea. So, you know, I, I think you're, it's not utterly impossible what you say, but I think it's, it's unlikely. All right, we're going to go around the table. Yes, sir, please. John Hurley, I'm uh, t uh, with Catholic University. There may be another referendum coming up after the election. There are increased indications that this could indeed occur as to whether or not the UK continues membership in the European Union. Um, this would have various implications, of course, but I'm thinking particularly of what this might mean with the uh, in continued strains that still exist in Northern, U in Northern Ireland. And in the past, it strikes me that the shared membership in the European Union had helped to kind of settle things down a little bit. I wonder if you would have any particular thoughts on this. Devolution certainly has implications for Northern Ireland as well as yeah. for No, Scotland. absolutely. I mean, thank you very much for that question, actually. This is my real love of po in politics is peace in Northern Ireland. I have to say, my mother, you know, was born in Northern Ireland and lived to the ripe old age of 97, only dying a couple of years ago. And, I, you know, the, great, the greatest moment of my life was when I was appointed a, a, a minister in the Northern Ireland office in the context of the delivery of the... Good Friday Agreement. It was my proudest moment. I love the people of Northern Ireland, you know, and I want to see them living peacefully. Um, I, I, a number of uh, people supported us in that work, um, and our EU partners were very important. But there were people. The most important people were our friends in the United States. There is no question that. Um, Commitment by President, successive President of the United States and very senior, talented diplomats and others from here, and the American Irish or Irish American, depending how you look at it, community support, which was not a given at the beginning of the discussion, given that their predominant inclination was towards a united Ireland, because diasporas tend, with respect to them, to live a bit in the past. Um, you know, was was really important. Uh, I am. Um, I honestly believe that although we're still challenged in Northern Ireland and that, that the job is not yet complete, that the reason the job is not yet complete is because, in order to get peace and a settlement, in the late 1990s, we had to embed sectarianism in their politics. There was no other way of doing it so that because we had to share power and therefore we needed a baseline for sharing. So without boring you with the detailed constitutional elements of this, you basically have to, you have to commit yourself to one side or other of the constitutional settlement long term in order to be in politics in Northern Ireland so that decisions that need cross-community support can provably get cross-community support from that baseline. Now, that... I use the word sectarianism. Uh, I mean, it's a political sectarianism, but it is partly a reflection of a kind of religious sectarianism as well, and significantly so. So we had to do that. But those of us who were responsible for doing that were very conscious that we had to find a way of moving out of that at some stage with the people of Northern Ireland. And that challenge is very difficult. And it's that step, you know, that we need help with. Um, and I think you're probably right. If we're living in a much bigger environment, um, then that's easier to do than if we're trying to do that, you know, in a United Kingdom that is outside of the EU. That's only one of a significant number of downsides of us leaving the European <coughs> Union if that's what the people of the United Kingdom vote for. I mean, I will do everything I can to try and keep us in it. Although, that having been said, I still think that the European Union and its institutions doesn't do itself any favours. You only have to go to, you know, 
the part of Brussels that they dominate to see their extravagant investment in institutions and to see why people are so hacked off with them right across Europe. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Hi, Alejandro Sanchez. I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. I read today in the BBC that youth unemployment in Scotland is in a six-year low, that 72,000 people aged 16 to 24 are unemployed, which is 29,000 less than last year, which is good, of course. But this reminded me how last year London closed 14 out of 19 army recruitment offices in Scotland. So again, my question is, how can the MOD continue to attract young qualified men and women to join the armed forces if, first of all, the economy is not really that bad, at least for Scotland, for the youth of Scotland, and two, if due to budget cuts, there doesn't seem to be much of, a, of job security in the UK military today, which serves as, not, as a reason for young people to join it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, it's an excellent question. Um, but, you know, if you are reducing the size of the army, then you need fewer recruitment officers, I suspect. I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't necessarily follow because life in the armed services is for, is, is for the majority of people in the armed services a part of their life and not the whole of it. So you constantly have to, you know, refresh. Um, and it tends to be a young person's job, although increasingly with technology, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so, so you are right, and, 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 and actually, you know, m m more than just the implication and the expression of your question, you, you know, o o over time, and, and during my time as the Secretary of State, I was responsible for some of this. We have increasingly broke the relationship between locations and regiments or, you know, for, for, you know, for very good reasons in terms of economy and professionalizing armies. Um, uh, sorry, professionalising our services, uh, but but you 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 know you, you're absolutely right in the point and 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 the point that you make, and you're also right, and I think the implication is obvious there that you know the services tend to have a better opportunity to recruit in economic circumstances where there are fewer alternatives for young people, um, but. We're looking for a different type of recruit now, I think, than traditionally people think they are, that we were in, um, uh, in, in those times. And I think we can still have professional, expert, and manned, you know, fully manned services of, uh, in, in an environment in which there is whatever the definition of full employment is. Um, and we got very close to full employment when I was a Minister for Work. I was a Minister for Work for a year. <laughs> and it was a good year. It was probably the best year that the year. Uh, yeah, and, and, well, well, no, I don't, I don't, I, because it was, you know, I, I, I only take credit for not having broken it. <laughs> you know, it is improbable that anything I did delivered in that year, but, um, but every day, every day of that year, there were more people working in the United Kingdom than ever before. I could say that every day with confidence from the statistics, but yet we had a much larger army, you know, and we had a much larger navy in those days and a much larger air force, you know, and we were able to recruit, train, and man it. So I, I think the correlation between these two things is probably changing significantly. Fantastic. Great. We'll go around. Simon, go around the circle. Good morning. My name is uh, Simon de Galbert. I'm a visiting fellow here at CSIS. Um, I, I would like to build on the, the question that was asked about the, the prospects of a new referendum, uh, which in my mind represents the uh, heaviest strategic uncertainty uh, in relation to the future of the United Kingdom and, and its place in, in Europe. And, and certainly from a French perspective, um, uh, a Brexit uh, would necessarily be a, a geopolitical uh, huge setback for my, for my country, for France. Uh, and so I would be interested to, to hear your views on the impact 
uh, that such event could have on the UK-US relation, uh, especially for the US, what, what would that mean strategically uh, to have a United Kingdom outside of Europe? Thank you very much. Let me start, and then Des will, Des will fill in the holes that I, I make. I, I think the first thing is, from an American perspective, a UK in the EU is clearly preferable. Uh, the second pro the, a corollary to that, though, is that the EU that, that Britons thought they were getting into a common market arrangement has turned out to be far more of a nanny state than was anticipated. And Des was talking about this behemoth in Brussels. But this is a nanny state that reaches into all aspects of British life. Indeed, it's, it's been amusing. I don't know if you find it. I find it amusing to find adverts saying, quick, buy these by these tea kettles and vacuum cleaners because the EU is about to ban them because they take too much electricity. You know, I mean, these kinds of things that you read in, in British papers. So the intrusion of the EU into parts of British life, which is, which is viewed as not subject to a foreign power, has created political issues in the UK. And you add to that UKIP, and you add to that the immigration problems. And you have a political mix in the UK which is, which is quite volatile. Not, it's I think of a higher order than the kind of problems we have here with the Tea Party, but it's of the same stripe. So um, how the UK sorts <coughs> this out, and I think it will sort it out to remain in the EU, is important. But it's also important for the EU to stop acting like the imperial court that it acts like. And when, they, when, when the Prime Minister, whether it's Mr. Cameron or, or Mr. Miliband, try to claw back some things into the, into the UK that don't affect the overall workings of the EU, but that do affect British life on a daily basis, I think the people in the EU hierarchy need to stop acting as if they are uh, emperors and, and, and kings and queens. Before I turn to Des to that answer, do you think uh, Labour will, before the general election s pronounced that it would also seek a referendum, or do you think that would not happen? That's a, that's a tough question. Mr. Miliband has been quiet on it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question, and I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, I, I quite often pretend to know more than I do about lots of things, but, um, but, uh, but on that, uh, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. It's not an easy or straightforward question to answer. I mean, I mean, what is true, even from you know my current view of Europe, um, and I, I mean, I, I, I am still heavily involved in the development of um, an organisation which I helped found called the European Leadership Network, uh, with a man called Ian Cairns, whom I worked with closely and know and respect very well, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a European, <laughs> um, and, and and Scots tend to be, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I see myself as European, and I certainly don't want my country to leave uh, the European Union. But we're not being helped <laughs> in trying to keep it in the European Union by some behaviour of aspects of the institutions of the Union itself and by commentary of others. Uh, you, you know, we we're kidding ourselves as the political classes if we don't appreciate that this issue of national identity is driving lots of political debate where it matters among the people who vote. You know, I mean, I already, you know, I, I gave a list that I drew from stuff that I read the other day. I think it was written by Jan Tikau of the Carnegie um, um, Endowment for International Peace, and I was just impressed by his list, and I wrote it down um, for deployments. And, but, but he's absolutely right. You know, that's what dominates the news. Um, and, you know, unless we find some way of engaging with these issues uh, in a way that makes politics relevant, you know, the politics that we think is, is the politics that is preferable, politics relevant to these decisions that are concerning people, then we are going to end up, you know, facing 
um, a campaign for, for coming out of the European Union, because that's the only way in which it can be dealt with. You know, and I would regret that significantly. You know, and, I, and, and I'm critical of you know, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, whom I admire in many ways, and I have to say this. Uh, you know, I, I, he's not of my party, and, he, and this man has admirable qualities. But I wish he would stop suggesting that there are things he can do you know, only to discover that he can't do them <laughs> because, you know, he sits in a context of agreements that don't allow them, you know, so this just makes it worse. Um, and like, you know, Scottish independence, you know, if, if, if the world had woken up to discover that Scotland was independent and the UK no longer existed, those of us who had in the past worked together would all have been diminished by that quite significantly. You know, and, 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 and the retrospective dawning of that realisation would, would have made a lot of people regret the fact that they didn't play in the game before. And the same thing will happen, I think, over the European Union if that's what happens. So, you know, I mean, we, I, I look to, you know, people who think the same way as me in Europe to try to find some way of working this out, you know. So whether the United States, of course, will say this is a matter for the people of the United Kingdom, you know, at the highest political level, because that's what we do. But I have no doubt that the United States, you know, and those people who observe the world think, that a European Union with the United Kingdom in it for the leadership that it gives and the engagement there is a better thing than a European Union without the United Kingdom in it. As I have to say, sorry, Moderator's editorial comment, I think what's going to be interesting, should there be a referendum on the UK and the EU, you are going to hear the same tactics that were used and uh, um, yeah, sorry, implemented yeah. in the Scottish yeah, referendum. Sure, yeah. So it is the, this is the worst thing, you yep. can't do it by yeah. yourself, yeah, and yeah, the absolutely. companies will say you're not, and, and I'm going to wait to see how so they react yeah. to that. And it's going to be very negative, and it's going to be yep. many of the Scots saying, how do you think we felt when that was the message that we were yeah. delivered? So oh. the dynamics yeah. here are going to be really, should it happen, really interesting. Although, sorry. I, I, sorry, I just have to say that the irony of this will be that the Scots who favour independence, who are very pro-European, will be making those arguments. Yes. That's <laughs> so they will be talking down the UK. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I'm just looking at the time. I, if, with your permission, can we bundle a couple of the next questions? I want to make sure we get everyone. So yes, sir, please. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Brian Bradley from the Nuclear Security and Deterrence Monitor. Um, Lord Brown, you had said that budget austerity could present some challenges for the renewal of UK's nu nuclear deterrent um, in the next political term. Can, can you comment on any chances for reduction of the nuclear posture in the UK? And um, could both of you comment on whether global security objectives could be met through a reduced posture? Thank you. We'll just keep going around the table. I saw a few other hands. Leo and then Bob. Yeah, go ahead, Leo. Um, sorry to stay on the nuclear issue. I'm Leo Michel, National Defense University. Um, ten years ago, probably, one would not have imagined that uh, the UK and France would have signed an agreement, the, uh, the nuclear part of the Lancaster House Agreement. Uh, given some of the financial considerations that you've focused on, um, France is facing some of those, but responding in a, in a bit different nature. Could you look ahead and say whether or not you see that there's a prospect for going further uh, in terms of cooperation with the French? If so, in what areas? And if not, why not? Bob, please. I'm Bob Beecroft, uh, Department of State, but most proud that I'm the grandson of Maggie Moffat of Cote Bridge. Um, uh, right. I spent four years in Bosnia, first as special envoy and then as ambassador and head of the OSCE mission working with an Ulsterman named Ashdown. Um, I'm concerned that Pandora's box is open and that it can't be closed. Or if it can be closed, I'd like to hear how. This issue of national identity, which you raised and which was and still is uh, fatal to the development of of Bosnia and other countries in that part of Europe seems to be catching. So my question is, how can you possibly coordinate a man managed devolution um, so that not only the English, but also the Welsh, 
talked about the Ulster, Ulsterman, and then there is Scotland, can come out in a way that will preserve the United Kingdom as a United Kingdom. And if you have a crystal ball handy, how does the UK look to you in 10 years? Great. Does you want to start? And then Frank, I'll have you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the first two questions are related to each other, actually. I mean, I hope the questioners agree with that. Um, the, uh, if I can start with the second first, I mean, the, the, the Lancaster House Agreement is a very significant um, step. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and although those discussions about cooperation were going on for some significant period of time, it is not coincidence that they came to fruition at the point at which the issue of austerity was was most keen. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it was the, the eventual agreement and the signing of the agreement was driven by the need to save money on, on the part of both countries. I don't think there's any question about that. It was trying to find efficiencies. And of course, it's trying to find efficiencies in an environment of the NPT in which you have to be very careful about what you share. Although, you know, that having been said, we're both significantly dependent in the United States, although the French would be less willing to tell the world that than I am. We're both significantly dependent in the United States for technology and advice and other things, all, I hasten to add, within the context of the NPT. But, um, so, so, I, I think for those who thought that this agreement having been reached was going to drive a dynamic, they may be disappointed. It's been comparatively slow in terms of its delivery, but these are areas where you have to be very careful. So I think there is, I think there is um, potential in that, and I think that governments will come back to that and look carefully. And in other conventional areas, we're working together, and as always, as you build trust and confidence in each other and working, then this spreads in the military family and, you know, and in and, and the expert family, and it becomes more easy to do it. Um, <laughs> Frank and I will disagree about this, but I think it's idiotic no. that I think it's idiotic that in an alliance, you know, that we have all of these boats at sea all of the time. I just don't understand it. We're the only people that do it. I don't understand why the rest of the world can sleep safe in their beds at night without them, because we apparently can't, and we have six at any given time or more. Um, now, apparently, I am told, and I've always been told this by the experts, that if you stop doing this, then you'll have to get out of the game, because this is the only way you can do it. You have to keep these boats deployed all the time, or you will not have an effective deterrent. Well, now that's fine, because that means nobody else in the world has one. Nobody else in the world has one. The Chinese don't have one. Why are we worried? Anyway, so I'm being slightly facetious, but this, this is also counterintuitive to everything else I was told by the military when I was the Secretary of State for the Feds. Deployment of capability deteriorates the capability, training maintains it. Right, so we keep these people deployed all the time on the basis that that's the only way we can keep this credible deterrent. We actually don't. We don't keep the same people deployed all the time. We keep boats deployed all the time, and as far as I knew, boats were inert. Right, so we change the crews. And we are having difficulty, all of us, in recruiting crews and training them to do this because it doesn't sit easily with people's lifestyle choices these days and submariners are not going back and back and back. So all of this, I mean, I, I think that part of the answer to our staying in the deterrent business, if that's what we choose to do, given the challenges, is to find ways, particularly inside our alliance, of genuinely doing what we talk about, which is sharing responsibility and sharing that responsibility in a much cleverer way. And it doesn't just involve agreements with France or the sorts of agreements we have with the United States, but, it, but I think we ought to be smarter about how we deploy our capabilities so that we don't all have to have the maximum amount as if we were all independent nations, because we're not effectively in relation to the way in which we work in this area, despite the fact that you know, we have to maintain a degree of independence about them. But that, that's my view, and I will continue to make that argument. Um, thus far, I'm not winning the argument with <laughs> Prime Minister bit, but eventually I think that I will coincide with costs to such an extent that people will start to kind of wake up and smell the coffee about this. Um, Pandora's box. Yeah, well, Pandora's box. Um, you know, th this is... This is <laughs> I, I, I have a personal answer to this question, right, which 
I, you, it will not surprise you having listened to me for a, a good part of this morning, it's pretty wordy, but it involves a kind of explanation of, sorry, it involves, an, a, a, it involves taking all of the forms of devolution that there is, that, that exist in the United Kingdom at the moment and creating, as it were, you know, a kind of, from minimum devolution to the maximalist devolution, creating a spectrum of them, you know, and, and allowing the elements of the United Kingdom and I would prefer city regions for England as opposed to England in its own, but this is a matter for the English people and not for me. But I would prefer city regions that are beginning, I think, across the world to become interesting areas of regional development and, uh, and, 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 and identity. I, I, I would offer to the component elements of the United Kingdom the opportunity to come into that spectrum wherever they wanted to, with only two preconditions. One is that once you come in, you can go up but you can't come down, right? So if you go into a level, you want to stay there at the very least, um, and that you must take responsibility for local government locally. You, however you determine how local government works, you must do it locally. Um, now, that would involve a much longer process than trying to resolve this by the end of November that the Prime Minister set himself the task of doing. I think it's probably too late for me to get his ear and suggest that maybe he should do that. But um, that would be my preferred solution to it. Uh, if you ask me to look into my crystal ball and tell you how the United Kingdom will look, what was it in ten, ten years' time? I think it'll look pretty much like it looks now. And Betty and Frank, you may have a difference of opinion with Des on the nuclear challenge question. You might. Yeah, I might. Um, I'm going to leave the Pandora's box alone. I you know, don't want to comment on something that I, I'm not expert on. Um, on the, the two questions. Uh, I, I, I certainly agree with Des that, that, that there are opportunities for increased technical cooperation, not only between the United Kingdom and, and, and France, but between the, the United States and the United Kingdom and France. Um, and, and I think that's, that's important. Um, but I think the, that the, the question about reduced posture goes into two fundamental uh, areas. First, whatever we do with a nuclear deterrent ought to increase stability, not decrease stability. And there is a notion among uh, Nick Clegg and his gang in the, in the Liberal Democrat Party that, that continuous at sea deterrent should stop the United Kingdom, that you send a boat to sea occasionally, you send the boat to sea without warheads. Um, you know, it, you could always rearm just in time. Well, I mean, August 1914 comes to mind. You don't get there just in time. And as far as our ability to predict bad things happening, it's not very good. The Trident Alternatives Review, which, which was produced by the government uh, in London uh, a year ago, points that out. Um, anybody who wants to, to, to contest that can tell me how they predicted that the Russians would take over Crimea in, in 24 hours. Our ability to predict is not good, or it's not yet good enough, to be able to say that we should not be able to have a deterrent which is capable of responding at any time, because that increases stability. The, the notion that, that a French SSBN could provide a deterrent for the United Kingdom is, not, is just not on. I mean, the French government, I, I love the French nuclear force. I love the people behind it. Uh, I talk with the French a lot. I started a dialogue between the Department of Defense and the French Ministry of Defense on nuclear deterrence 20 odd years ago. The French the French government cannot even bring itself to sit in NATO councils on nuclear weapons, neither the high-level group nor the nuclear planning group. So, so if you can't even sit in a NATO forum to listen to discussions, there's no way that the French government can allow a British submarine to provide deterrent cover for it and, and vice versa. So that's, that's just not on. Um, the other thing, and I, I, I really, you know, I, I have to make the point. Um, there are other ways of maintaining nuclear forces on alert besides having a submarine at sea. The Russians have hundreds of ICBMs on alert right now. The Chinese have ICBMs on alert. Russian SSBNs are now once again on patrol des. Um, so, so, because the UK has no nuclear bombers 
and it has no ICBMs. If the UK is going to maintain a deterrent 24-7, 365, it has to have a submarine at sea. And for the United States, maintaining SSBNs at sea mitigates the prospect that a massive attack requires an immediate presidential response. And so I say again, for U.S. and U.K. and indeed French submarines at sea, is, st is stabilizing, not destabilizing. And taking steps in the other direction would in fact undercut the stability which, which undergirds um, uh, the relations that we have with, with the Russians and the other nuclear powers. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I, I mean, I'm just glad that we're having this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it was off the table for a long period of time, and I think we need to have it. And I'm also pleased that the arguments that used to be deployed are no longer being deployed because they're not credible. So I think we, you know, we're not going to have this today, but we need to have, I think, a conversation, an intelligent conversation about this issue of crisis instability. And, and I want to have it with, particularly with Americans, who by the use of ratcheting up and down their DEFCON standards, have done the opposite for years. The most recent example was when the North Korean young leader moved his missiles to the coast and threatened the United States. It may not have been a credible threat in terms of his capability. But I am told, and I'm told by military leaders who take the credit for this, that they deliberately flew dual-capable aircraft near his borders to make it clear to him that there were nuclear weapons available to be deployed against them. Now, that they claim credit, and you could hear a deafening roar of that from this city when he stepped back, that the very opposite dynamic was generated by that. So I just, you know, I think this is, this is not a truism that the deployment of nuclear weapons leads to instability. You know, we have to, I think, we have to test this the same way as we would test all other arguments. Just because it's about nuclear weapons, we don't have to stand back in awe of this. You know, we have on our boats at any given time nuclear weapons that may or may not be on ready alert but maybe at days of capability of using them. We can move them up and down inside those boats and in vulnerability underneath the sea, and nobody knows what we're doing. You know, so there are great ways, there are ways of doing all of this that could be to our advantage. There is no definite correlation between the deployment of nuclear capability and increased instability. And actually, if you look at the United States' history, despite all of the challenges that this great country has gone through, it has never once, with nuclear weapons, had to go to the highest level of DEFCON. Never once. So, you know, I mean, what is the possibility of us being in that environment in the future when we have not, having lived through the whole of the Cold War, the Cuban crisis and everything else, never got to that stage? I think we need to be much more intelligent and engaging and honest about this argument, and it starts here, and I'm delighted we're having it. I agree. I'm delighted we're having it. I, I, I'm delighted that Des made my point when he talked about SSBNs being at sea and invulnerable, and you don't know what they're doing, because that is exactly the point. They're at sea and invulnerable. And I would, I would, I think historically you're wrong. I mean, if, if, if you mean DEFCON 1, that's, that's point of war. DEFCON 3, which is maximum, maximum alert, we have unfortunately gone to, at least for the Cuban Missile Crisis and in the 73 Arab-Israeli War, but that's a historical footnote. And the other thing is, is there's a difference, as I think, and this is part of the, the broader debate, which I, I do welcome. If we had no nuclear weapons on alert, if the ICBMs were down and the SSBNs were all in port, and we suddenly started sending B-52s to fly over North Korea, or fly near North Korea, that would be an entirely different situation than if we had the ICBMs on alert and the SSBNs at sea, and this was just something else on top. 
So anyway, I do look forward to this continuation of a debate that Des and I have been having for years. You have just allowed us to have a great debate, which we will continue. We didn't even get to the rest of the world. We didn't get to, to the Middle East. We didn't have an in-depth conversation about Russia. What so clearly we, no, no, clearly we need to have bring this conversation. Bring us back. I agree. I think we should uh, bring you back. Lord Brown, we okay. are so delighted you are here in Washington so we can do this more often. Mr. Miller, thank, thank you, you so much for your insights. And colleagues, please join me in thanking our two speakers for a very lively debate. Thank you.